Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We are all sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and his sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For transgression of my people was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will, be, will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. I was going to say it, but uh, Albert already did. He is risen. <laughs> yeah, the standard greeting. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. Let's pray, and uh, we'll see what the Lord has for us this morning on Resurrection Sunday. Lord, we want to thank you for everything you do. We want to thank you for meeting us here in this place. We do not deserve your presence. We don't deserve to have your breath in our lungs. We don't deserve to have this this book that you have given us in order to know more about you and know you more. We, we don't deserve any of that. Lord, we want to thank you for our opportunity to celebrate Passion Week, for Palm Sunday last week, when Jesus Christ was inaugurated and he established his kingdom on this earth. We want to thank you for Good Friday when Jesus gave up his life an atonement for the sins of his people so he might build a kingdom for himself and we, we want to thank you Lord for the resurrection it is because our Lord has been raised from the dead that we know that we will also be raised from the dead. God, thank you so much for the amazing Easter gift. Be with us now as we come to your word. 
Open our ears to hear. Give us eyes to see. Renew our minds again. And through the proclamation of your word, Lord, conform us to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, who, who gave his life a ransom for many. Lord, we love you. We love you, we love you, we love you, and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, this entire week, I've been reflecting each day of Holy Week. Of course, has its own name. Did you know that? If you've been, if you've been keeping up with the Blacktop Pulpit videos, then you know what each day of the week means. Palm Sunday, which was last Sunday. Fig, Monday, Holy, Tuesday, Spy, Wednesday. Uh, Maundy, Thursday. Maundy just means commandment Thursday, when Jesus commanded his disciples Love one another as I have loved you. Give your lives for one another. Forgive one another. And uh, Black Saturday, which after Good Friday, Jesus was crucified on Saturday, the Sabbath. He rested from all of his work. He completed his work in six days, and on the Sabbath, he rested, which is a perfect parallel with the six days of creation. And then on Sunday, he rose from the dead and began a new work, the work of renewing his creation fully through his church, which is amazing. So I've been reflecting on these truths all week this week, and uh, I've been mainly in John's gospel in my personal time and for Blacktop Pulpit, and I got to John chapter 20, the account of the resurrection. And Peter races John to the tomb. Of course, John doesn't refer to himself by name. He refers to himself as the beloved disciple. <laughs> and the beloved disciple just so happens to be faster than Peter. Ah, okay, John, I see what you're doing there. And so they, they go to the tomb, but Peter goes into the tomb first. They find the tomb open and empty. Peter goes in first, and he's astonished. At, he just sees the, the cloth there, the burial cloth, the shroud. He sees it there in the tomb. The body of Jesus is gone. And in chapter 20, verse 9, John records that they did not yet know that this was to fulfill Scripture, how this fulfilled Scripture. They did not yet know. Uh, they would know by the end of the Gospel, but they did not yet know in chapter 20, verse 9. So because they did not yet know that this happened to fulfill the scriptures, meaning the Old Testament, primarily the prophets, the disciples went home. <laughs> That's how the, that, little, that little discourse ends, right? They, they went home. Okay, so I was like, okay, the, the resurrection fulfills scripture, the Old Testament prophets. So I started thinking, where in the prophets do we see the resurrection. Where do we see prophesied in the entire Old Testament the resurrection? And would it surprise you? It's not there. Huh. How can this be to fulfill Scripture, to fulfill the prophets, if it's not explicit in the prophets that the Messiah would rise from the dead, be raised back to life again? Uh, I, while the Old Testament doesn't say that explicitly, I think the Old Testament prophets do necessitate that. So I want to show you from Isaiah 53 how the resurrection of Israel's Redeemer, Israel's Re Messiah, is necessary according to the prophets. Isaiah 53 is a popular passage. We read it just a moment ago. It is about the suffering servant, the redeemer of Israel. Uh, the New Testament authors from Matthew all the way to Revelation, uh, they identify the suffering servant. They refer to Isaiah 53 quite often. And they identify the suffering servant as Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the one who came and gave his life and rose from the grave. So I thought, yeah, it's appropriate to come to Isaiah 53 to see how the resurrection fits into the equation and what the resurrection accomplishes. Uh, you know, and many people say, the resurrection happened in order for Jesus to prove his divinity. We don't read that in Scripture. 
it's perfectly plausible that Jesus, having given his bodily life, having given up the flesh, would choose to exist as he always has in his divinity. So his divinity does not, never has depended on his flesh. He did not rise from the grave in order to prove his divinity. Did he rise from the dead so that we might know and be able to trust in him? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us that either, yet I hear it often. Does Scripture tell us that we are the apple of God's eye and he gave his life and he rose from the dead because he could not bear the thought of being without us forever? The Bible does not say that. The Bible never makes that claim. In fact, that's kind of narcissistic, right? So I look to Isaiah 53 and I ask the question, were the New Testament authors correct. Of course, I believe they are. I believe it's inspired scripture. But I ask, what, what was their hermeneutic? How did they arrive at the conclusion that Isaiah 53 was about Jesus and not some other suffering servant? Well, how do you find out who Isaiah is referring to, who Isaiah is describing in chapter 53? Read chapter 52, <laughs> okay? Use, use the Bible to interpret the Bible. Uh, context, context is key. So I just want to point out a couple things here in Isaiah chapter 52 before we walk through chapter 53. Isaiah 52 verse 1, uh, God through Isaiah is calling Israel to wake up. <laughs> wake up, Israel. Awake, awake. O Zion, that's in chapter 52, verse 1. And then you look down to chapter 52, verse 3. Talking about Israel, God through the prophet Isaiah says, You were sold for nothing. Here referring to the uh, oppressive nature of the other nations, the fact that other nations would come in and they would take Israel into captivity, take Zion into captivity, steal them. You were sold for nothing and you will be redeemed without Money. So here, God the Father through Isaiah is talking about the redemption of national Israel. And he's going to pay for Israel without money. He's going to pay for Israel with something else because Israel has been oppressed by means other than money, by means of violence and by means of captivity and by means of their own sin, their own transgressions against God. Look down in verse 6, now in chapter 52. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day, meaning the day of redemption now in context, I am the one who is speaking. Here I am. In that day, the day of redemption, God's purpose will be to reveal himself. Not merely to free a nation, not merely to end oppression. Those things serve a purpose. And it is that God may reveal himself that he would be the one glorified that he would be the one exalted not national Israel and continuing in Isaiah chapter 52 skip down to verse 13 God through Isaiah says behold my servant my servant here referring to the one who will redeem God's people the one who will make the Father famous, the one who will reveal and glorify the Father, my servant, will prosper. He will succeed. He will earn his reward. Verse 14, Just as many were astonished at you, my people, Israel, so his appearance was marred. Talking about the Redeemer of Israel, his appearance was marred. Here, Isaiah telling Israel straight up, 700 years before Jesus is born, his appearance was marred more than any man. This guy will be beat up. His, his, his flesh will be broken. He will be marred. And his form more than the sons of men. He will be unrecognizable. Thus, he will sprinkle many nations there. The word sprinkle referring to what happened at the altar, atonement. So this guy, this redeemer, he himself will be broken. And his blood will be sprinkled like an atoning sacrifice. He will be a sacrificial lamb, so to speak. 
The kings will shut their mouths on account of him. They will be humbled. For what had not been told them, they will see. And what they had not heard, they will understand. And in this context, we get to chapter 53 in Isaiah's prophecy. <laughs> Who has believed our message? That's how chapter 53 starts. So Isaiah tells Israel, look, the Redeemer's coming. God will redeem the nation. He will free the nation. He will liberate the nation. He will atone for the nation. He will do so through a Redeemer whose body will be broken and blood will be sprinkled as absolute atonement, final atonement for the nation of Israel. And in 53 verse 1, Isaiah goes, who has believed our message? Like, we're telling you, we're prophesying this, and still the nation of Israel does not believe. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The insinuation there is, well, no one. You're not getting it. The nation of Israel is not getting it. The work of the Lord hasn't been revealed to them. They don't believe our message. And 700 years later, when the Messiah does come, they're still expecting Him to come with power, even though this is foretold in the prophets. And then in verse 2, in chapter 53, Isaiah begins to describe this Redeemer who would come to redeem Israel. He grew up before Him like a tender shoot. And like a root out of parched ground, he has no stately form or majesty. He was born in humility from a lowly family. Not born like you think a king should be born. That we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He's kind of a meek man. I'm sure Jesus had some muscles because he was a carpenter, but <laughs> beyond that... He, he appeared to be just your average Jew. Looks something like a, a Pakistani man or an Israeli today. He was despised and forsaken of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face the outcast of society. What good can come from Nazareth? He was despised, and we did not esteem him. This Redeemer who would come, he wouldn't appear to be anything special to the Jewish nation, to Israel. And he would walk among them, and people would turn their faces from him. This is the identity of the suffering servant, the redeemer of national Israel, the king God would send, the Messiah, the one who would atone by the breaking of his body and the spilling of his blood for Israel. In verse 4, we begin to see the Redeemer's atoning work. So Isaiah has already mentioned this. The Messiah is going to come. This Redeemer is going to come. And he's going to atone for Israel. And now he expounds on that. Verse 4, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our, our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And here Isaiah reveals something very important. The nation of Israel, as a slur toward their Messiah, their King, their Deliverer, their Redeemer, they would esteem him as stricken by God. They would regard him as stricken by God, cursed. I mean, they called for his death, didn't they? This man is poison. And the Pharisees spoke kind of like that. We need to do something about this guy, this blasphemer. He's stricken of God, demon-possessed. He's a glutton and a drunkard. That's what they said about Jesus. The irony is, Jesus really was stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, but not in those ways. 
their sin was being imputed to him. And just a little later in chapter 53, we're going to see that the father was pleased to crush Jesus. Verse 5, But he was pierced through for our transgressions. This is how he was smitten of God. This is how he is afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions. Do you remember the, the Roman soldier at the cross? They saw that Jesus' body had already died. He had already given up his spirit, so they didn't break his legs. Instead, they did what? They ran him through with a spear. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, crushed under the oppressive weight of Rome and of sin. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. Why did Jesus do this for the well-being of Israel? You don't hear this kind of message today in our world. That somebody would sacrifice himself for the good of others, give up his life for the well-being of others. Instead, to seek welfare, we use the system to support our own selfishness. That's the message today that we receive from the world. But Jesus does exactly the opposite. Sacrifices himself. The chastening for our, that's Israel's well-being, fell upon Jesus. And by his scourging, the nation is healed. Why? How is the nation healed? By the scourging of one man. Well, this Redeemer, he is taking on the affliction of the people. He's imputing it to himself. He, being righteous, doesn't deserve this kind of death. The nation of Israel does. Complete destruction, utter wrath from God. Judgment. But this Redeemer, in order to redeem the nation, would take their transgressions upon Himself. That's imputed sin. And He would give Himself on behalf of the nation so that the nation would not be judged, condemned continue to be oppressed by their sin and the consequences of their sin. This is how the Messiah would redeem the nation. Verse 6, All of us, here Isaiah talking about himself and his kinsmen, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Can you, can you hear Isaiah pleading with the nation? All of us, we've gone astray telling them, trying to reason with them about the coming Redeemer. Each of us has turned to his own way, fulfilling our own desires, following after our own lusts, self-identifying, self-glorifying. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Brothers and sisters, that's pride. And that's being led by human pride. That is wicked before God. And Isaiah is saying, we're guilty, kinsmen, Israel. We are guilty. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Him. Listen to the gospel Isaiah presents. He doesn't say, we've fallen We've sinned, we've transgressed, we've done wrong. Get your acts together or else. <laughs> Sometimes the prophets do that and Israel's never able to. But instead of doing that, this time Isaiah says, but the Lord, meaning the Father, has caused our iniquity, our sin, our transgression to be placed upon Him, the Redeemer He is going to send. Isaiah is talking to his current generation, which means they were saved the same way we are after Christ. We can glean that from this passage. It's beautiful, wonderful. And again, we see imputed sin. This is the great exchange. 
our sin, our transgressions were imputed to Jesus and he dealt with the consequences on Calvary. And his righteousness was imputed to us so that we never have to suffer the consequence of sin if we are in him. Do you understand, brothers and sisters, that we, we are all s- sinners against God? It would be foolish of us to say, I have never done anything wrong. <laughs> Some of you got a little stressed out this morning and didn't trust God in that moment, okay? <laughs> oh, it's, it's almost 8.30 and we're not dressed yet. <laughs> right. That's okay. That sin has been imputed to Jesus. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Like, do you understand how good of a message this is? And what we get to celebrate during Passion Week? What price Jesus has paid to buy His people. That's what redeem means. And He paid with His body and His blood, fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy here in chapter 53. The Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Him to be imputed to Him. Verse 7, He was oppressed. Why? Our transgression was imputed to Him. Therefore, He is oppressed. And He is afflicted. Because He quite literally is bearing the sins of His people. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. He didn't complain about bearing this burden. What is the message of our world today? If somebody hurts you, commits injustice against you. Sue them. Somebody hurts you. Commits injustice against you. You need to get that retribution. Well, and we've taken that to kind of an extreme, haven't we? We, by we, I, I mean the nation. It's very broad, okay? Very general. If your ancestors did my ancestors wrong, you owe me retribution. And the gospel being preached today is, make no mistake, a gospel of retribution, which itself is works-based righteousness. It is what has in the past been called the social gospel. It is what has in the past been called the liberation gospel. And it entirely contradicts Jesus' actions on Passion Week, who took upon himself the oppression and the affliction of his people, willingly was oppressed for the good of others, and went to a cross, gave his life without uttering a single complaint. There was one time in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, God, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But that's not a complaint. That's anguish. Still he was willing. And still he went to the cross like a sheep, silent before its shearers. He did something we cannot do. He bore a burden we cannot bear. He made it possible, if we are in him, to live with forgiveness to others and to not expect retribution at all. That's the kind of life forgiveness empowers us to. Do you realize that? Those who are forgiven much, you remember reading this in the Gospels, don't you? Those who are forgiven much, forgive much. Those who are loved much, love much. And how much have we been forgiven our sins? Not having to repay that, not having to buy into a false gospel that screams retribution rather than forgiveness. He did not open his mouth. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment, he was 
taken away. Or the oppression of the Jewish eldership, the oppression of Rome, and the imputed oppression of sin, of transgression. By this he was taken away by Judgment he was taken away because now the judgment of the Father is squared not on the nation of Israel but on the Christ, on the Messiah, this Redeemer who would, who would present his body and his blood for the atonement for Israel, the final atonement, absolution for sins. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, the generation of Jews living in the first century who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living for the transgressions of my Isaiah's people to whom the stroke was due. The Christ generation considered him cut off, but he was cut off because of their, their sins, their transgressions that were imputed to him. In verse 9, his grave was assigned with wicked men. How was Jesus put to death? On a, on a cross. Make sure not to knock over this microphone as I... Uh, yeah. On a cross. There, I can, on a cross. Who was crucified on a cross? Murderers, zealots, thieves, those who did sins that were otherwise unpardonable and that they couldn't pay for with, with prison time or with a hefty fine. And Jesus was put to death like a criminal, fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy. He, his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death. You remember Joseph of Arimathea who took Jesus from the cross, asked for his body, buried him in a rich man's tomb, made sure his body was taken care of like, like a rich man's body would be taken care of. I mean, he made sure Jesus was treated like a king. He was sure to rest him in the tomb before the Sabbath so that there was no desecration. And there Jesus rested until Sunday morning. Yet he was with a rich man in his death because he, this Redeemer, had done no violence. Basically a, a pacifist who wasn't afraid to make statement, statements still by throwing over temple tables. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But doing no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. He never lied. Always told the truth. And here we learn this Redeemer, this Redeemer had no sin. And Isaiah, as he's foretelling this, he's like, this Redeemer will have no sin. That's why the sins of his people can be imputed to him. He will fulfill all righteousness. And you read in the Gospels, like especially in Matthew's Gospel, where Matthew is writing and he says, this happened so that Jesus could fulfill all righteousness. Okay, Or Jesus saying, this is necessary so that I might fulfill all righteousness. Isaiah prophesied he would fulfill all righteousness. Like Jesus is fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 53 to a T, to the letter. Fulfills all righteousness, gives up his life, dies like a, like a criminal, but is buried like a king. And still in Isaiah 53, we haven't seen anything about a resurrection. Huh. In fact, when Jesus gives up his life, Scripture claims his work is finished at the crucifixion. It's finished before the resurrection. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Look with me at John chapter 19, verses 28 through 30. This is the account of the crucifixion. 
And Jesus is on the cross. This is Good Friday. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished. All right, there it is explicitly. At the crucifixion, all things are accomplished. Jesus doesn't have to do anything else. He's not going to rise from the dead because it's required in order to fulfill the scriptures. He's not going to rise from the grave in order to prove his divinity. He's not going to rise from the dead, so we have a reason to trust in him. Nowhere does the Bible make those claims. In fact, Jesus from the cross says, everything has already been accomplished. He knows everything has already been accomplished to fulfill scripture. And he said, I'm thirsty. <laughs> I need a drink. Of course, I'm sure it was a little drier than that. Probably said with, with more anguish. And a jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a, a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. There it is. On Palm Sunday, he comes in. He's inaugurated as king. And in six days, on Friday, he gives up his spirit. He says, it is finished. My kingdom is established. I am king. I am reigning. That's what is finished. The scriptures are fulfilled to the letter. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Why then the resurrection of Jesus? Our answer is questioned. Oh, excuse me. The question is answered in Isaiah chapter 53, starting in verse 10, as we continue through the passage. But the Lord, the Father, was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. But why was he pleased to crush Jesus? If he, that is the Redeemer, would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will see means Jesus can still see. The Redeemer will still be alive after the crucifixion. Well, that's cool. He will see his offspring means that those who are in Christ, given to him by the fathers, the way Matthew's gospel puts that, those who are given to him by the Father, he will see them. He will be with them. They will be his. And at this point, I, I think maybe the resurrection isn't about us at all. Uh, the crucifixion accomplished the work of redemption for the people of God. And in the resurrection, Isaiah says, the Redeemer sees his offspring, sees the fruit of his labor, the fruit of his anguish, the fruit of his grief and affliction and oppression. And he sees this fruit as a reward for the work he did. In essence, and Albert, you love to say this and you love to point this out, and I just have to do it from the pulpit too because it's biblical. Jesus is given those who are redeemed as an inheritance. But the resurrection shows us that the Father is giving Jesus the church as his inheritance. Our eternal life is just the first step of Jesus receiving his own inheritance. And just like Isaiah has prophesied, this works to the glory of God, not the glory of man. This works for the exaltation of Christ, not the exaltation of humankind or of any individual. A Christ's resurrection is for Christ. 
Because that is how God the Father receives glory. And in His resurrection, He is forever the federal head of His creation, the federal king of the land and sovereign over every nation on earth. Not only is He divine Lord, but He is federal king forever and ever and ever and and ever and ever and ever, (laughs) etc. And so on. He will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. He will be in in the body, in the glorified body, the resurrected body forever because he is to be the federal king over his creation and within his creation and as part of his creation. This works to the glory of God and the exaltation of this redeemer. It won't be a person. Adam couldn't do it. We needed the second Adam. And Jesus will be like this forever. See, the resurrection wasn't necessary to accomplish the redemption of people or to fulfill the scriptures, but it is necessary for the glory of God according to the prophets. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in His hand as a result of His federal kingship, federal headship within creation, which means from the moment of the resurrection, Christ, by the will of God, is renewing the earth, causing the earth to prosper more. This seems kind of optimistic to be in the Bible, doesn't it? (laughs) But if Christ is Lord, how can we preach anything else? If He has risen from the dead, how can we say He is not at work within His creation? We we cannot, as a result of the anguish of His soul, He will see it, the redemption of His people, the building of His church, the renewing of the earth, the prosperity of God, He will see it and be satisfied. It's like you remember Genesis chapter 1, right? After each day of creation, God stepped back, He observed what He did, and He said, It is good. And Jesus, as time moves on, and Jesus is working, and He is continuing to renew the world through His church, it's like each evening He steps back, takes a look at what He did that day. Oh, we don't often recognize what He has done. Sometimes to us the world seems to be a pretty terrible place, doesn't it? But Jesus is stepping back, looking at his progress, looking at his kingdom, it is good. Like the Father said, it is good. He observes the work of his hands and he revels in that. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge. The righteous one, that is the Redeemer, the one who is righteous and the one who redeems the people of the Lord, by His knowledge, the Righteous One, my servant, the Redeemer, will justify the many. He will not justify all of Israel. Isaiah is recognizing this, and he's telling Israel, not all of you are going to make it. He's justifying the many. those of whom the gospel says they are given to him by the Father and those given to Jesus by the Father will be saved, will be completed. And not one of them can fall from the Father's hand. There's a doctrine referred to as limited atonement. And here the prophet is speaking particularly to Israel. And the New Testament writers would would take this doctrine and apply it to everyone. As He will bear the fruit of their iniquities. Jesus does not fail in the atonement. Now if Jesus atoned for someone who does not make it, that means Jesus failed. Atonement is not made for every person. Every person experiences the grace of God. This is true. Every person can hear the gospel. This is true. Every person has an opportunity to respond to the gospel. This is true. 
Our problem is, and according to Isaiah, whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who has believed our message? Not everyone believes. I'm quite certain not everybody has the capacity to believe. In fact, I'm certain no one has the capacity to believe this message. That God would would care so much that he would send the second person of the Trinity, his son, to die on a cross and be raised to life again so that we might have eternal life, live forever. That's that's all out there if you're looking at things from a worldly perspective, isn't it? It quite literally takes the Holy Spirit coming in and flipping a switch in the heart. Taking out the heart of stone, replacing that with a heart of flesh causing a person he has chosen for himself to have an epiphany and to hear the gospel with fresh ears, which I think he is working out in our nation today so that the Redeemer will justify the many because he has borne their iniquities. And here we, we see a great promise. If Christ died for you, you will be saved. (laughs) Amen to that. I'm so glad the gospel does not depend on me. I'm so glad Christ's work does not depend on me. Verse 12, Therefore I, this is the Father, will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the spoil with the strong. Christ in his resurrection takes on the strength of the world strength over the world Christ in his resurrection assumes for himself possession of all material things on this earth all material kingdoms on this earth the prosperity of the nations does not belong to the nations it belongs to the redeemer his resurrection means he inherits everything his church the worldly nations that the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our lord and of his christ and he will reign forever and ever The Redeemer inherits all this in His resurrection. It's not required to fulfill the Scriptures. It is necessary if Jesus is to be the federal head of His creation and to rule over the nations in a federal way. Why will He inherit the earth like this? Why will He be given all authority in heaven and on the earth? Divine authority and federal authority. Why? Because He poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many. There we see it again. Not all Israel is Israel. And he, this Redeemer, interceded, interposed his precious blood. He interceded for the transgressors. That's my Jesus. That's what he has done. That's what Isaiah foretold 700 years before Jesus and before you get to thinking, wait a minute, after Jesus, some guys just went into the Old Testament and added chapter 53. We have a copy of this chapter dating to 120 years before Christ. There's no way that could have happened, okay? We found it by the Dead Sea. It's in a collection from Qumran. Feel free to Google that later. It's easy to find. Yo. Jesus fulfilled Isaiah's description to the letter. And of course, Isaiah is speaking to Israel as Babylon is marching in to take Israel into yet another captivity. The New Testament authors apply this to Jews and Gentiles, all people. And they don't do this without reason. You say, wait, is that a proper application? Is it proper to take a chapter that is written to 
national Israel, about their redemption and their Messiah, about the atonement of Israel's sin, and apply that to all nations. And then you realize in chapter 19, Isaiah wrote something crazy like Assyria and Egypt will be considered one with Israel. That the nations will be grafted in. And therefore the atonement is for the nations. But not everyone of every nation will be saved. The many. The New Testament authors applied this to the nations. Jesus, in his resurrection, inherited all nations, and he has atoned for his people among the nations, and he is calling his people among the nations to himself, and we're seeing his people among the nations converted as a result of the crucifixion, and we are seeing the nations crumble as a result of the resurrection, and the only kingdom that will remain in the end is Christ's. Oh, happy Easter. <laughs> Jesus fulfilled Isaiah's description to the letter. There are three things we need to remember this Resurrection Sunday. First, Jesus fulfilled all righteousness on behalf of His people. If Jesus fulfilled all righteousness on behalf of His people... You don't have to be good enough. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. But it's yours anyway. If you repent and believe the gospel. Two. Jesus died as a substitutionary atonement. Meaning that, meaning that there is forgiveness because the wrath of God was poured out on Christ. The wrath I deserved poured out on Christ. He took my sin. My sin was imputed to Him. He suffered the consequences for that. And His righteousness was imputed to me. And you've heard it said before, this is accurate. When the Father looks at me, He does not see my sin. My sins were dealt with on the cross. Instead, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I am being conformed to Christ's image now. The law is being written on my heart. And one day, that work will be complete. And God who calls, he is what? Faithful and just. When he, when he begins a good work in us, he will bring it to completion. That's the promise of sanctification by faith, not works. The atonement was substitutionary which again is just better than the gospel of the world the gospel that screams retribution for centuries old sin the gospel that speaks work the gospel that speaks if you're not doing the right thing or saying the right thing you are unacceptable come on world <laughs> This is the 21st century. Can't you get past that yet? Uh, the fact of the matter is no. Worldly people are not capable of thinking any other way. It is not until we experience the amazing forgiveness in Christ that we are then able to forgive others and love others unconditionally, whether we are being oppressed or not. Jesus' death was a substitutionary atonement. And three, Jesus was raised to life in order to receive his inheritance. And if we look forward to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17, Paul says, because of Christ's resurrection, because he was raised, we know we will also be raised. Here's the call this morning. The invitation, if you will. Christ is renewing His earth. Will we follow Him? First in His death, and then in His resurrection. Will we die to ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow Jesus? That's what, that's what it means to repent and believe the gospel. 
to forsake my identity, to forsake my glory, to forsake my sordid gain, and to say, Jesus, you have inherited the whole world to confess that He is Christ, that doesn't to confess, confess Him as Lord, which doesn't mean make Him Lord. Confess means to, to profess with, con with, fess, profess, to profess with, confess, to agree with Jesus that He is currently Lord and He currently owns all things, including me. To be a slave to Jesus, to repent, believe the gospel, confess that Jesus is Lord. And if you haven't yet to be baptized, baptism doesn't have any power in and of itself. It is a testimony of what Christ has done. We are buried with Christ. We die with Christ. And we are raised with Christ. Look, you can't have the resurrection if you don't first die with Christ. And that death doesn't mean like we literally climb up onto a cross and be crucified. It does mean that since Christ is the one who is crucified, we give ourselves wholly to Him. We pursue the calling He has for our lives. So repent, believe the gospel, be baptized. And if you are not a member of a healthy local church, oh, it's time to stop time to stop wasting time doing things that are not as important as the gospel and the renewal of the earth and the bringing of peace and of justice and the being conformed to the image of Christ and growing in our knowledge about who God is and our, and our righteousness. It's this time to get plugged in. If you are in Christ, you need a church family. And that does not mean merely attending on Sunday morning. That means being a part of of the body of Christ, bringing the gifts that God has given you by His Spirit, bringing those in, using those to build up the body of Christ, however He has gifted you to serve or to provide or to teach or to translate or to bring healing God has not given you those gifts to waste on yourself. There is a higher calling. There is a higher purpose to come be a part of a community that will hold you accountable and in which you can hold others accountable. Thank you, Scott. (laughs) Last week, Scott comes up to me and I said, man, you look a little tired. And he goes, no, just the opposite. I feel great. I said, all right. Oh, cool. All right. Yeah. He's like, I got to work out this morning. And I said, uh, I need to start working out too. <laughs> Can you hold me accountable? <laughs> Y'all, I lifted weights three nights this week. <laughs> and rode my bike just a little bit. <laughs> and I got to say, it feels sore. <laughs> I, I feel great. So thank you. We, we all need that. However, however we can contribute, plug into the body, build up the body of Christ, whether God has given us the gift of generosity or any other of the gifts I have already mentioned. I was going to say them all again, then I realized that's this going to be redundant. I don't need to be redundant. Okay. Brevity. Right, brother? Where you at? Where you at? Where you at? Oh, right here. Yeah, brevity. That's it. That is the call upon our lives. Repent, believe the gospel, be be baptized, become a member of a healthy local church in a serious way. Not just, uh, membership isn't just having your name on some list, please. That's overrated. Okay? That's required legally for 501c3 organization for members to vote. Okay, that's not the most important part about church membership. That's, that has to do with the law of the United States, Caesar. No, we belong to Christ, not Caesar. Be a part of this thing for His glory, the exaltation of Jesus Christ. Why? He bought us as slaves. And yes, that's the language Scripture uses. 